Back in 1973, a fleet of aircraft allowed the American Skylab to stay in touch with ground control. But to make a bigger space station, it would require the marriage of two sworn enemies and the union of two incompatible spacecraft. In 1975, the United States and the Soviet Union make an announcement that shakes the world. They will pool their resources to create a single space station. This joint effort will be a symbol of the thawing of the Cold War and bring an end to the tensions of the space race. Here's the plan. The Soviet Union will launch a Soyuz spaceship from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Simultaneously, the USA will launch an Apollo spaceship from Cape Canaveral. Both craft will dock in orbit 220 kilometers above the Earth. Here, the American astronauts will meet the Soviet cosmonauts, and together they will conduct the first ever international space mission. One of the American astronauts was Vance Brand. I thought it was going to be a very interesting flight with a, obviously an international flavor, uh, a lot of challenges, something that uh, we had to do right. But the uh, bigger challenge was uh, getting together with our, uh, well, I guess you'd say back then, our enemies and uh, pulling off a uh, successful space mission. But a huge engineering challenge also emerges. The Russian and American spacecraft are a mechanical mismatch. Both were designed at the height of the Cold War, behind a veil of secrecy. And in one crucial aspect, they are incompatible with one another. The air pressure in the two ships is completely different. The air in the Russian Soyuz craft is maintained at the same pressure as air on Earth. But on the American Apollo craft, the astronauts breathe pure oxygen stored at a much lower pressure. If the Americans open the hatch, the sudden change in air pressure could have a devastating effect on their Russian counterparts. It would cause the nitrogen normally dissolved in their blood to reform as bubbles of gas. And these bubbles could kill the cosmonauts. This condition also afflicts deep sea divers if they resurface too quickly. They can prevent it by sitting in a chamber where the air pressure is gradually decreased. Engineers borrow this idea and fix a decompression chamber to the front of the Apollo ship. Once the two craft dock, the American astronauts will leave Apollo and enter the chamber. They will wait there for three hours until the air pressure equalizes to match the pressure inside Soyuz. Then the astronauts should be able to safely enter the Russian spacecraft for a momentous handshake. Fifteenth of July, nineteen seventy five. 
Vance Brand and the Apollo crew set off on their mission. When we connected, why, uh, there was a slight lurch and uh, latches made, and uh, there we were. We were elated. Uh, it meant that uh, we'd gotten there successfully, nothing had gone wrong, and uh, we'd accomplished step one of our mission. Step two, the Americans wait for their bodies to acclimatize. Tensions run high on both sides of this iron curtain. When the uh, hatch into their spacecraft was open, why there were sort of a cheers and shaking hands and hugging and, uh, and all that, it was really a base that was put in place to uh, improve future international cooperation, especially between Eastern Bloc countries and the West. Welcome aboard Soyuz, we see that too. It may be almost forgotten now, but uh, we made steps that uh, improved world relations and we uh, uh, developed a, uh, a pretty neat new docking system too. This extraordinary meeting sets the tone for future worldwide cooperation on the even more ambitious International Space Station. Today, Space Shuttle Atlantis, with its precious cargo, approaches the International Space Station. Set, all right, here we go, in the center position. After a three-day journey, the shuttle prepares to dock. Moving it to the right about maybe 15 minutes or so. Net, uh, dash five, three, five. Flight controller standing by for contact and capture of the International Space Station. The new module has arrived safe and sound. So too has the multinational crew. The station has maintained a permanent human presence in space for nearly a decade. That's largely thanks to the engineers who have found a way to recycle humankind's most precious resource. Water. At Marshall Space Center in Alabama, scientists have built a mock-up of a space station module to perfect the latest water recycling techniques. and they move civilian volunteers into the sealed chamber to live just like astronauts. We use this chamber to help us generate real life wastewater as representative as possible of the wastewater that the astronauts generate while they're in the space station. Extractor fans suck in warm air laden with perspiration and collect the sweat evaporating from wet clothes. The scientists give this sweaty fluid a polite name, humidity condensate. They also manage to recover the water in urine. Urine, not surprisingly, is more contaminated than the humidity condensate. So we put that through it's an initial distillation process. We can recover about 85% of the water that's inherently in urine. The recycling system on the space station manages to recover an incredible 94% of the waste water produced by the astronauts. And the crew not only drink this water, they breathe it too. Inside the space station's life support system, 
electricity is passed through tanks of recycled water. This charge of energy splits the water into its chemical components, hydrogen and oxygen. Pumps channel the oxygen through pipes that run throughout the craft to carry the life-giving gas to the crew. Fresh air from sweat and urine. This technology is vital for future manned missions to Mars. A return trip could take two years, during which time a crew of four would use over 36,000 litres of water. So it's crucial space scientists learn how to recycle every last drop to minimise the amount the crew have to carry on board. So we can get by with 94% efficiency on the space station. But as we look beyond space station to establishing permanent outposts on the moon, or for sure when we go to Mars, 94% efficiency still isn't going to be good enough. So our next challenge is to improve on the efficiency of systems like this so that we can uh, approach as close to 100% efficiency as possible. 